Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for our presentation titled Simplifying Component Selection in Lateral Flow Assay Development. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Klaus Hotschleiner, Global Technology Lead in the Diagnostics of Sativa. For complete biography of our speaker, please visit the tab at the top of your screen. If you have any questions that might arise during the presentation, we encourage you to submit them in the Q&A box. Our speaker will address your questions following the end of the presentation. Please join me now in welcoming Klaus Hotschleitner. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Welcome, sir. Well, thank you for the introduction and welcome to this presentation on component selection and lateral flow assay development. Lateral flow assays are rapid tests that are unrivaled in terms to speed and ease of use. The point is that their development can take an awful lot of time. So typically starting from the test idea over component sampling and development and design verification, you can easily spend up to 12 months and including stability tests, regulatory approval, uh, validation, scale up, it may last a total of two years. You want to get this step correct. And that means that you need to select your components early and in the correct way. In general, a lateral flow test consists of a couple of different materials uh, that serve different purposes. And the sample flows laterally through these pads and membranes and generate your test results. Basically, we discriminate between two assay types. One type is called a sandwich test. Um, that's being used if you can bind two binders to your specific target molecule. Binders can be antibodies, can be antibody fragments, can be aphimers or aptamers. The point is that you can bind two of them independently to your target and they do, they do not interfere with each other. The other option is a competitive test. In that case, you cannot bind more than one binder to your target molecule. And that means you have a test line that already contains your target molecule. And in a negative sample, your antibody, your detector antibody will bind to that test line and if the target is present in the sample liquid, you will see a decrease the signal at the test line, while in the sandwich test, you see an increase in the signal at the test line. Both tests are being uh, used today. And as an example for a sandwich test, uh, that's the well-known pregnancy test. And an example for a competitive test would be a drugs of abuse test. Typically, a lateral flow manufacturing process consists of a number of different steps. So you coat the sample pads and potentially blood separators and conjugate pads with appropriate buffers. You apply your detector conjugate to the conjugate pad and dry it. You dispense your test and control lines onto the membrane. If necessary, you would coat even the wick. You will affix all components to a self adhesive backing card, cover this card with a translucent cover tape if the test is to be sold as a dipstick or you will cut the card into strips of defined width and encapsulate these strips in a cassette house. And it's not to be sold as a dipstick. So what we have here is a multi-component system. The advantage of this multi-component system is that this test strip contains all chemicals and reagents that are required, and it contains them in the dry state. In most cases, you need no sample preparation at least let's say no external sample preparation because you can add a number of buffers to the sample application pad which is the first pad in your test and force your sample to have a specific iron strength or a specific ph the end user just adds the sample and lets the test run until the results get visible and that means it can be handled by lay people the test result is appearing rapidly. Uh, a typical test duration time is something between five and 15 minutes. The obvious disadvantage is it's a multi-component system and it's very challenging in development and manufacturing. When you develop an MFA, 
labeled antibodies or aphimers, aptamers, other binders like strep evidin or neutravidin, capture binders, and the test membrane are all integral to the success of a lateral flow assay. And that means you have to have a thorough selection process and you must ensure that these components work together. And you have to have an eye on the properties of your sample liquid and the specific of the target molecule that you want to detect. Selection and optimization of binders is an important step, but these binders communicate with the membrane, if you want to say so, and that's sometimes not being addressed correctly during LFA development. Let's talk about that reaction membrane. So the key considerations is on a couple of parameters which we will discuss as far as they are important for your test development. And we will talk about capillary rise time, about membrane backing, about blocking the membrane, and about membrane surfactants. And we will come back to that specific point later. Very often, the correct choice of the membrane uh, will come down to the nature of, the nature of the test being designed, and it may be reasonable to test many product variants. So capillary rise time, what is that? That's the time that a liquid, and typically this is water, needs to flow a defined distance on the membrane. And typically this is 40 millimeters, and that's being used as in-process controls and membrane manufacturing, and it's what we call a specification parameter. And at the lower left of that slide, you see what determination of capillary flow time or capillary rise time looks like. Typically, membranes are characterized by a specification that has a specification mean, for example, 80 to 100 seconds for uh, a very fast membrane. And um, it has specification limits, which we'll, we'll discuss in a minute. Very uh, fast membranes are being used for things like saliva, resolubilized solids. Uh, medium fast membranes, which typically have a flow time of approximately 120 to 135 seconds as specification means will be used for things like blood, serum, and plasma, or for urine. And very slow membranes, which have a flow time of roughly 180 seconds, will be used for things like water. All suppliers manufacture the membrane to a defined capillary rise time. And that's our, the main specification parameter when we manufacture membranes. While this capillary rise time specification has an upper and a lower limit. And that means you have to take care that your reagents or your test results are working the same way on both ends of the specification limit. If you have an issue with membrane specification parts at the fast end, you can easily see false negative results. The sample runs too quickly across the membrane and you do not see the result on the test plan that you would like to see at the, at the detection limit. If you have an issue with the slow part of a membrane specification, you may get false positive signals or you will have an issue with membrane clearance. That means the membrane is not white again uh, when the test duration time is over. In rare cases, we see issues at both edges of the specification, and then it's getting really difficult. Um, what you should do is you should test membrane samples from both edges of the specifications, something that we call limiting samples, and look for the performance of your test. It might be that you have to select a different membrane rate if you run into trouble, or it might be that you will have to ask for a customized membrane, a membrane that works with your test and has its own capillary rise time specifications. An important point here is that binders, are, although they have the same affinity constant, may be different in terms of the on and off rate of uh, the binding reaction. For lateral flow tests, you would be interested in very fast on rates because the interaction times that you have available at the test line, but also for the conjugate, are very, very short. 
antibodies that have the same affinity but have slow on rates and slow off rates are typically ELISA antibodies. They will not work perfectly well in lateral flow assay test. So if you have a bunch of antibodies available, um, you should try to get surface plus one resonance data that describes the on and the off rate of the binders. If you have just one pair available and no choice uh, for selecting another reagent, you will have to play with the speed of the membrane. So if you have to use binders that have relatively slow on rate, you will have to use a slow membrane if you want to have a chance to reach your detection limit. Membrane backing. Well, what is that? Um, when you manufacture nitrocellulose membranes, uh, what is being done is the nitrocellulose raw materials are dissolved in organic solvents with boiling points lower than that of water. Uh, these casting mixes are poured onto a solid surface, typically a steel belt if you want to have an unbacked membrane, or a plastic belt if you want to have a backed membrane. The membrane is formed on that support and uh, in case of a back membrane, it's not lift, lifted off the support, so it stays there. Um, the advantage is it's mechanical stability. You will not be able to tear that apart. The disadvantage is you have to live with the upper side of the membrane. And what that means, you see on the right part of that slide. Uh, what you see here is two electron micrographs of an unbacked membrane that's called A100. That's a fast uh, lateral flow membrane. And what you see that the upper side, which we call the air side, has a relatively coarse structure. Um, obviously, a random structure, which is typical for nitrocellulose membranes. Uh, but the right side, which is the belt side, the part of the membrane that was forming directly on top of this support steel belt, um, has a denser structure, which means a higher protein binding capacity. And it looks more regular, so it's not as variable as the air side. If you want to use an unbacked membrane, use both sides, and it could be very advantageous to use then the belt side. The downside is the mechanical stability of an unbacked membrane. Um, and especially for beginners in the field, our recommendation is use the back membrane. The nitrocellulose matrix of the membrane binds proteins. And you like that. You want this membrane to bind proteins as long as you dispense your tests and control lines. As soon as these binders have been bound by the membrane, you are left with an awful lot of membrane area that's still open, has not bind anything yet. This membrane would bind anything it would find in your sample liquid, your target, your detector reagent, whatever you offer. And that means you will have to block these free areas in order to prevent them from interact with your target or your detector. And there's two options. Uh, at first, you can do something um, that's called block on the fly. In that case, blocking reagents are part of the pretreatment buffers of your sample pad or your conjugate pad. These reagents are dissolved by the sample liquid. They migrate with the sample and block the membrane while the sample liquid is moving across the membrane. And that's the reason why it's called block on the fly. The advantage of this process is uh, a cost reduction because the alternative is a blocking in a separate manufacturing step. In that case, um, the membrane is treated with the tests and control line reagents. The reagents are dried. And then the membrane is soaked in a buffer, or you spray a buffer onto the membrane that contains the blocking reagents. A separate manufacturing step means um, another step that needs to be tested, developed, validated. Um, and of course, it's the cost factor in manufacturing. The advantage is you have full control over the amount of blocking reagents that you apply to the membrane. If you do block on the fly, you have to live with the thickness variability of the pads that are in front of the membrane. 
and that means you will have different concentrations of blocking reagents in your migrating liquid since you will have variable thickness and that means variable pad volume but you will always apply the same volume to your cassette housing or your, to, to your dipstick and that means your sample liquid is always the same it's always the same volume uh, but the amount of molecules dissolved in it when it runs through the pads will differ that's especially difficult when you want to develop a quantitative test system and for quantitative tests, uh, a separate blocking step of the membrane is more or less unavoidable. And many people are not aware of the fact that the reaction membrane contains a surfactant. All nitrocellulose membranes contain surfactants. And the surfactants are needed because the nitrocellulose membranes are quite hydrophobic matrices and only the surfactants make them really hydrophilic. So surfactants have been a part in nitrocellulose membranes since their very infancy. And the oldest pattern that I could find was from 1917, so it's more than 100 years old. And even that membrane already contained the surfactant. In protein applications, not only lateral flow, but also flow through tests or Western blots, these surfactants help to mobilize your binding proteins to the membrane matrix. Different suppliers use different surfactants and apply them at different stages of the manufacturing process. So it makes sense to test membranes from different suppliers for your specific application. This denaturation process binds proteins to membranes and you need that. The problem is this process denatures proteins. It can easily be that in the monoclonal antibody or the aphimer or the aptimer that you are using, the surfactant destroys the binding site or at least reduces its activity. In that case, you may have to switch to another membrane that contains a different surfactant, or worst case, you may have to look for different binders. I have worked with more than 1,000 different monoclonal antibodies and all kinds of other binders um, during my work in lateral flow diagnostics. And from what I've seen is two to 3% of all monoclonal antibodies um, that means two to three percent of the clones do not work on membranes because the antigen binding sites are destroyed by anionic surfactants and in that case although it's a rare case there is no way out you can't make that run on a nitrocellulose membrane and you have to look for a different binder But even if you can immobilize your antibody successfully, um, you should keep in mind that, um, that this immobilization is a random one. That means the antibody is not bound with its FC part to the membrane and the antigen binding sites are protruding into the free migrating liquid. Any orientation of the antibody is possible and there's two things that you have to look for. One is, is that a preferential orientation that blocks the binding sites because the binding sites binding to the membrane? In that case, you have a problem with the antibody antigen interaction. And the second question is, um, how close are the two binders to each other once they bind to your target? If they are too close, you will run into trouble with steric hindrance especially in membranes that can easily happen. And our recommendation is you should do epitope mapping using surface plus one resonance to make sure that your antibodies uh, are doing what they want them to do without interfering with each other. It can also give you reliable data about on and off rates. And you could also test for inconsistencies uh, from batch to batch. And you can test for lack of compatibility with the use of specific reagents. What you also have is pads on the left and the right side of the membrane. 
So you have a sample pad that you can code with buffers that may contain reagents that block the membrane. But typically, and much more importantly, they contain reagents that take care that at least some key parameters of your sample will always look the same after the sample has dissolved this buffer that you have coded into the sample pad. An example is urine. Urine is coming with a quite acidic pH in the morning and it get, gets alkaline in the same patient towards the evening. So a typical range in pH is something between 6.5 and 8. What you can easily see that especially specific binders like monoclonal antibodies change their binding characteristic when you change the pH. Um, it makes an awful lot of sense to take care that every urine, regardless when it was collected, has the same pH when it runs across the test. And this is what you achieve in the sample pad. Your sample pad may also be a blood separator. Um, as the name says, it's being used when you use whole blood as a sample, and its task is to remove the blood cells, especially the red blood cells. Um, still, the main detector particle in electrical flow rapid test is gold, gold nanoparticles, and that's red. And if your red blood cells leak onto your membrane, you try to look for a red signal on a red background, and it's not very likely to give you very good signal to noise ratios. And that is what you, why you need a blood separator. And then you have your conjugate pad. Um, that's the most tricky part of the test, to be honest, um, because what you expect it to do is you expect it to absorb the conjugate pad that you dispense on it. Um, in the liquid form, and you definitely should dispense and should not soak the pad with uh, the detector. Then you dry the conjugate in the pad, and you would like to, uh, this conjugate to remain stable and not be destroyed during the drying process. And then you expect, after a year of storage in um, a drugstore, a household, uh, a doctor's office, under more or less dubious environmental conditions, uh, you in earnest expect the conjugate pad, when the sample enters the conjugate pad, to release this dry conjugate into the sample and make it run across the test. And the, uh, the detector reagent on the conjugate uh, is supposed to find its target to bind it as it would do it um, before you have applied it to the pad. And that's a very uh, interesting expectation. And our mistakes uh, during preparation of conjugate pads are, are the most likely root cause if you run into trouble with your rapid test. And finally, you'll have an absorption pad, uh, often referred to as a wick. The task of this pad is to capture a sample liquid and to retain it. Um, what you should take care of is that the absorption capacity of this wig is much larger than the volume of the sample liquid that you apply. Because what you have here is a um, matrix that generates your results, that's the membrane, which is very thin compared to all other pads. It will dry first, and then you create a concentration gradient. Um, and uh, what you can see then is a backflow from the wick onto the membrane, which will give you all kinds of unspecific uh, weird phenomena on the membrane, and you do not want that to happen. You would like to uh, have the membrane wide as long as possible. Um, some FAQs and some common issues. Um, very often uh, I'm asked, what is the pore size of your nitrocellulose membrane? In plastic membrane, uh, back membranes, the pore size cannot be determined directly. That's due to the plastic backing. And that's the reason why all membrane manufacturers refer to capillary rise time or capillary flow time uh, as a specification parameter. Um, as a rule of thumb, a very fast membrane has a very large pore size. Um, and a given sample liquid will run faster through a very fast membrane uh, than it does through a, a slow membrane. The point is, depending on the properties of your reagents, of, especially of the capture reagent on the test line, um, a fast membrane is likely to give you a lower sensitivity as compared to a slow membrane. 
Um, as said, it depends also on the properties of your capture reagents. A capture reagent with an extremely high on rate gives you a very good sensitivity, even on a very fast membrane. A capture reagent that has a disaster of an on rate might not even work on the slowest membrane that you can buy in the marketplace. Another question is, what adhesive is used uh, in your back membranes? Um, no membrane manufacturer is using an adhesive to create a plastic back membrane. These back membranes are 100 micrometer thick polyester supports onto which the casting mix is poured and the membrane is formed on this polyester support and it stays there by simple adhesion. Um, adhesives come into play once you laminate these membranes onto the backing onto which you also have to fix all the pads that you need to create your rapid test. A number of couple, uh, a couple of issues as listed on the right of the slides, um, including possible solution. So what is frequently seen uneven lines or dots during the dispensing process. Um, you may use different membranes with different capillary flow times. Um, you may use the dispensing rate of the reagent, uh, perhaps including disp uh, reducing the dispensing volume. If you do that, you may have to increase the protein concentration of the reagent. You will take care of the buffer composition and you will check the dispensing process. And although many people don't like to hear that, um, in a sizable number of cases, the reason for uneven uh, lines and dots is lack of maintenance of the dispensers. So it makes sense to clean them properly and to take care of their function. False positive signals um, in terms uh, of, of membrane issues can be modified uh, by changing the buffer in the conjugate. Uh, you may peak, uh, tweak the, the pH, the salt concentration. You may play around with surfactants and worst case, if that you have to change a conjugated protein. For false negative results, um, a typical solution would be to uh, reduce the capillary rise time. That means to use a slower membrane. This very often leads to a better sensitivity of a test. Increasing the sample volume is also an option, uh, but there are limits to that in the lateral flow test. Um, so the typical sample volume is 100 microliters. You can use something like two, perhaps 300 microliters. The idea to run one milliliter across a lateral flow test is simply not feasible. So there is an upper limit to that. Uh, what is also sometimes seen is uneven liquid fronts of migrating samples. Um, it might be that you have stored your membrane too long, uh, but in most cases, it's a problem with either uh, that you're using a relatively hydrophobic membrane. That means a membrane that has uh, a very low surfactant content. And the other option is that you have a problem with the relative humidity in the room. And if this is too low, um, then you will see uh, flow issues. Uh, the question with um, the hydrophobicity of membranes is a very interesting one. Um, hydrophobic membranes, or let's say membranes that have a low surfactant content, they're not really hydrophobic, can easily give you better, better sensitivities because they have a less negative impact on your binders, especially on the test line. Um, you can modify the uh, hydrophilicity of the membrane then by are playing around with the blocking buffer. So a membrane that is relatively hydrophobic and you like that because it gives you a better sensitivity should be blocked in a separate manufacturing step because then you can deal with uh, any uneven liquid fronts or migration issues that you see and still have a better sensitivity than you would have with a high surfactant membrane. So to summarize that, uh, the nitrocellulose membrane is the core of your lateral flow assay because this is where the end user sees the test result. Getting the right membrane first time, or at least um, as soon as possible, is key in uh, 
keeping your lateral flow test development and on track within specification and on budget. Um, choosing a membrane is not just simply using a paper. It needs to be considered alongside a lot of other key decisions, and it has to be done in our conjunction with reagent selection. The membrane needs to be able to immobilize antibodies. It should not affect their binding capabilities, um, and it must enable the sample to flow at the optimal speed. And it makes a lot of sense to work closely with your membrane manufacturer to discuss uh, common pitfalls, uh, to discuss uh, what can be done and what cannot be done with a given set of reagents, uh, and perhaps to design in a membrane that's manufactured according to your needs. And if you have questions, please feel free to talk to us. Thank you. Thank you, Claus, for that outstanding presentation. We will now move into the live Q&A portion of the presentation. Claus will unfortunately not be able to join us for this portion, but we do have Lee Jenkins joining us, Senior Product Leader for Sativa. Welcome, Lee. And I just want to remind our audience members to please submit their questions via the Q&A box. Looks like we already have some great questions coming in, Lee. So let's get started. <clears throat> Our first question is, what are the common reasons why people fail to develop a viable test? Okay, yes, thank you, Ryan. Yeah, just to repeat, apologies to everybody that close can't be here for the Q&A session. But um, hopefully I can help answer these questions and anything you wish to discuss with Klaus, we can take offline. So with regards to the common reasons why people fail, Klaus just did an excellent job. <clears throat> In the video, I've talked about different reasons, but essentially, you know, I think to summarize what he presented, there are many different factors involved in developing the test. So it could be anything from the detection pair um, your detection reagents, um, reagent use, which pads, membranes you select, the backing card selections, or even the working environment and the equipment setup. So every single factor involved will affect the overall performance of the test. So in terms of test development failure, it really does depend case by case. And you know we can help you if you're troubleshooting, if you need this support. But um, we support that. Uh, we suggest that. You know, look at maybe the capture of reagent selection or the texture selection and reagents of the tests are probably a key place to start. But um, unfortunately, you'd have to test all of those items. Thank you so much, Lee. Our next well, question, why does a test take so long to develop? For example, the COVID-19 test. <laughs> Golden question. <laughs> so everybody yeah. wants of the uh, quicker development and um, uh, to develop a normal lateral flow test can take two to three years to people a customer to get from development get through clinical trials and get onto the market um, to develop a, a good robust test you know normally you take an absolute minimum of one year at the r d phase so to go for the whole tech transfer and scale up after that the stability trials obviously requires time as well. So everyone's working with absolute urgency um, during the current pandemic to get tests as quick as possible. But you know we need to allow time for that development for the optimization in order to fulfill all the needs. Um, understanding COVID is a special situation, and we do have some emergency use authorization to bypass some of the timelines. But you know it still takes time to go for such a complex. Uh, development. I hope we close this 30 minutes this presentation you know, touched on some of the elements of why they take quite so long to complete the process. Thank you so much, Lee. Can you talk to the audience a little bit about the development of challenges of multiplexing? <laughs> okay, yes, yeah, so another good question. So I guess first of all, there are several different types of multiplexing assays. So you could have a array of strips, 
you could have spatial separation and protection sites, you could have a broad selective recognition element, or you could have a variable signal reporter. And the primary consideration when contemplating multiplexing in a lateral flow assay would be about the cross reactivity and interference between the assays, because this might impact your signal. There's sample treatment method compatibility, there's sensitivity and dynamic range of each of the parts of the test and each of the targets that you're trying to detect. There's stability and you know the assay format. You know, if there's a mix of effective and sandwich assays involved, then this has a whole extra level of complexity. When talking about the multiplex assay, you know, a membrane which nitrocell is select is a key element. So we suggest that when you develop a multiplex that flow assay, you know, they need to consider upfront the number of test lines they require, the viscosity of the sample, the desired or you know, at the very least the acceptable test runtime, the kinetic properties of the cancer reagents, and then as uh, Klaus touched on in this, the membrane surfactants are obviously very important, and that would need uh, testing and sampling of different membranes and some what works well with your assay. Thank you so much. And I want to thank our audience members for these great questions coming in. Lee, what blocking agents are typically used and how does the impact, um, how does this impact flow rate, for example? Okay. So normally we block our conjugate parts and nitrocellulose membranes. For the conjugate parts, the purpose of the blocking is to make the conjugate stable during the whole shelf life of the test. So make your conjugate release efficiency and you know, repeatable from the conjugate part. You can start to block your conjugate parts by you know, developing several different um, formations. So we have a standard process of a, a boring a BSA buffer that we use, but um, I suggest that if you want to get in contact with our teams after the meeting, we can help share some details of what we've used previously. But people need to keep in mind that different part materials and different tests will require different buffers. So there's not one bespoke solution, which is why I'm a little bit hesitant to you know, share too much on uh, this question. With regards to the nitrocellulose, the purpose of blocking the membrane is to reduce the unspecific binding of the protein. So different concentrations of BSA can be tested as a blocking buffer here to see how the impact is on the overall test. Thank you so much. And how do you start to evaluate membranes based on what surfactant they use? Okay, so yeah, I think Klaus did uh, again a session on this, but the surfactant is a very important factor of a nitrocellulose. You know, he mentioned that all nitrocelluloses on the market have surfactants present, generally different types. So you need to understand that not all monoclonal antibodies will work well in a presence of a given surfactant. That antibody testing in the presence of various surfactants um, is critical to optimize the performance. So we've got you know, a feeling in our site that about 3% of monoclonal antibodies will not work in the presence of any surfactant. So others may only work at low surface, uh, sorry, low surfactant concentrations. So it's again very much around that testing, evaluating, you know, trying to test as broad a range as possible during your early development stages. Um, different surfactants in the membranes may lead to different test results. So you may get changes in sensitivity, you know, positive or negative um, influences on your test, or you may get false positives if you are not compatible. So that's really key to the testing element, and then. Also, the way the surfactants introduce the membrane can have a big influence on the results. So we have different product families at Saitiba of Nitrocellulose where the majority of our grades, such as the FFHP grades, we add surfactants, the cast-in mix, and we do this because we believe that it gives a more consistent mix of the surfactants to the membrane. Some other product families that we release or that our competitors have available, they post-treat the product after manufacture with surfactant. 
Again, it can have a different impact on your performance, positive or negative. So we encourage you to test both to see what works well for yourself. But you know, it may lead to more variability or less um, consistency of the surfactants if you use a post-treated uh, membrane. The type of surfactants, concentration of the surfactants, you know, they're all proprietary to each membrane supplier. So they're not going to necessarily tell you what surfactants included, but you know we suggest if you talk to our application specialists, they can give you more information on you know what they regard regarding our memory of surfactants and what could work for your test. Wonderful, thank you so much. Well, and Lee, what are the scale up factors that one needs to consider during the test development? So before I answer this, I guess the the best answer for today is there's a session later in the summit about scaling up your development. So we got Avondon Health talking about the importance of a contract manufacturing organization and talking to them early in your development. So join John's session later today to understand exactly what's involved there. We also have BioDot coming on at the end of the event to talk about how they can bring scale to the test. But from our side as a component supplier, you know, we suggest that you choose materials from high quality suppliers with you know appropriate levels of technical support. Ensure the membranes you are purchasing are available at a large scale and that there's no capacity concerns. That's especially critical at the moment because around COVID nineteen we're seeing you know some suppliers are having a run on membranes that have the normal level of availability that they would have had previously. <clears throat> Consider dispensing membrane ranges using non-contact methods. So this can just help your automation and the volume possible. Avoid immersion processes where possible. Uh, use covalent conjugates, which are appropriately optimized and stabilized. Uh, what other suggestions have I got? Um, use inline processing and automated process controls. Use a controlled manufacturing environment. And then in your development, you know, concentrate on appropriate device design and assembly methods so that you've got a test which can go from a lab-based test into a full automation scale test. Again, if anyone needs any support over these scale up uh, conversations, you know, please speak to our teams. They can help guide you on suggestions of what we can provide here. Thank you so much, Lee. And thank you again to our audience. This next audience member <clears throat> proposes a question from their own lab and hopefully can get some assistance from you. He writes, besides we consider the capillary flow of the membrane, is there any other factor which could help to control the capillary speed? For example, they have a problem with their capillary flow right now in that their assay is too fast and they've tried to add Surf surfactants or even blockers for the membrane, but it wasn't significant. Can you help them with this problem? I can, but also I suggest that you know if they want to reach out to any of our contacts or any of our field application support teams, they can discuss very specifically. But at a high level, the advice I can give is that the surfactant generally will not help slow down capillary flow time. This is not something that the surfactant brings to the membrane. Blocking can help a little bit, but again, not a huge um, contribution. The most significant way of affecting the flow rate would be looking at the membrane and the parts that you use the assay. So the wick and the sample conjugate parts, you know, what is the wicking rate of those, but also what's the capillary flow time of the nitrocellulose. So try pads and membranes which have a, a slower rating for the wicking and capillary flow times. So all membranes and pads are released with defined membrane speeds. So talk to your supplier, understand you know, what they have, um, what membranes you have now, and where that is in the, the range, and try to select something with a higher reading, so a higher measurement which gives you a slower, slower membrane. You can even talk to your, your supplier and see if you know if you seem to fit in between two parts. You're not going to correct level of sensitivity. The see if they can give you a custom flow membrane, which is at the higher end of the specification to the test. 
No, outside of that, it's probably looking at the affinity binding rate of your detection pair. You know, you need to go back to do something like SPR analysis to understand the on-off rates um, using vehicle or something similar. But you know, this can often mean restarting the whole development process. And you know, we would suggest looking at the parts in the membrane your first simpler step. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I hope that helps her. Our next question, can the choice of antibody type, for example, antibodies, optimers, affirmers, affect the flexibility of choice of NC membranes and ultimately the speed of the assay? Yeah. Um, <laughs> another one where it really depends. So typically the capture reagents will work differently with different holy flow times and surfactant types. I wouldn't say that there is any restriction or the flexibility around choice, but it goes back to you know the mantra doing development, test as many different varieties as possible when you're selecting your membranes and your pads. You know, test different families, different speeds, you know, just to understand what performance you're getting. If you're able to test to test your affinity binding of the pair you know, via the SPR analysis, which you know, I just mentioned vehicle is a way of doing that. Then again, it can help you understand you know, what capability you have within your test. But unfortunately, it's going to be a trial and error activity for the customer. Thank you so much. We have time for a few more questions. Is it possible to obtain a highly sensitive and quick reaction by changing the antibody type rather than the membrane test itself, membrane itself? Yeah. OK. So. If you have a test which is running at present with a antibody and you're looking just to switch that over to a optimal or optimal, that's highly unlikely because it's you know very rare in lots of flow and we test that you are able to make a simple swap out of one component to another, especially something as critical as the detection regions. Um, you probably would have to go back through the whole redevelopment and essentially it'd be close to developing a new test. Looking at different detection types, you could get faster speeds and you might need, um, you know, a, a more sense, you might get, sorry, a more sensitive assay, but it all really depends on your affinity binding rate and how it's compatible from your all components in your test. So again, not a direct answer, but it's very specific. If you have a test that you want to help me talk to, again, I encourage you to contact one of our team offline and we can help discuss this with you. But um, there's not a one size fits all solution to this answer, unfortunately. Thank you so much, Lee. Now, if we inject, for example, two proteins into a membrane, but when checked, only one protein appears, what does one do? And whether do they replace the membrane or the process for the protein that must be correct? Yeah, um, it's all good to discuss very specific cases such as this in um, a general format without knowing more detail. Um, I don't want to keep referring to the same response, but you know, if the customer is able to contact us, we can step an NDA and talk a lot more detail about their test and understand exactly what they're doing to Know, consider all aspects. Um, from a high level, it's quite all, you know, quite difficult to see what could be the unfortunate. Thank you so much. Maybe, uh, yeah, unfortunately, that's one of us to defer to to offline um, today's call. No problem. How do you minimize serum interference in the serology LFA? Okay, so the simplest way of minimizing interference is by having a good blood separator. Um, Klaus touched on in the presentation very briefly, you know, there's different blood separators available, but you should essentially try different um, sample volumes and different blood separators to understand what would better your test. There is a, you know, a lot of information out there and different suppliers do have different uh, separators. If you need more advice, you know, I advise you to look through to the Cytiva website where we do have some content around our different blood separators and how this can work within your test. So you know, 
encourage you to get in contact. If you need samples from us to see what works well, then we can happily supply these to you. Thank you so much. Now, Lee, our next audience member has a question about validity and reliability. If things like humidity and the shelf life of the membrane can impact the test, and assuming packaging can mitigate this to an extent, but not completely, would the typical validation line at the end of the test be the only method to determine a faulty test? And if so, how reliable will it be? Yeah, interesting. So the validation line, I assume you mean the control line. Uh, so yes, this would be, you know, obviously your North Star, as we say. So this would be your ultimate way of understanding once the test is developed, you know, if it's failed. But I would go back to that this is all about development, this question. So ensuring that you have a rigorous development, that you are fully testing the stability during your early processes that you are understanding the capability of your assay. You don't want to do this once you've got through development and you've got a product on the market. If you're relying on a control line to tell you whether the test is faulty or not, you know, you're in serious trouble. You want to understand all of this very early in the process, understand the shelf life or your conjugates, how stable they are once they spend someone's stride, understand the stability of your whole test. And the only way to do this is by stability trials and you know, a rigorous development process. Thank you so much. And again, what a great, lively conversation from our audience today. What are the reasons yeah. for getting ghost, ghost bands with capture antibody on the test line, and how do I get rid of it? Again, it's one that sounds very specific to this customer's assay, so hard to give a, an answer which is going to be definitive. You know, providing a solution to them. So again, feel free to contact our teams offline where we can help discuss this. But um, Klaus outlined in the presentation some ways where we have you know, faint lines or these ghost bands. It's all generally about looking at your non-specific binding or having a look at your um, dispensing rates around the test. It's something which, you know, we could help talk more details offline, but it's very difficult to get in this forum to kind of give you a definitive answer on what would work for this test, unfortunately. Wonderful. Thank you. And the same audience member wants to know, what is the optimum capture antibody concentration for the test line? Yeah, again, it's going to be very specific to your test. Uh, what antibodies you're using, what you're trying to detect. Uh, not able to give you a definitive answer on that in this forum. Um, if we want to talk about, we can give you some examples of you know, what concentrations we use for different targets. Um, we can say from our experience what's worked well, but that's a broad um, statement across the whole of the flow. Uh, very difficult to comment, unfortunately. We have time for one more question. We, I have a problem. This is coming from an audience member. I have a problem yeah. with assay sensitivity and suggested to add stacking pads on it. Could you recommend some suitable properties for the stacking pad? And should we treat the stacking pad with a buffer, for example? Yeah. Um, so if you've got sensitivity issues in your test, then this could help. Um, but no, by no means it's going to be the only solution for you. Um, this goes, again, to understand without knowing what your test is. Um, important considerations when looking at your pad would be what um, working rates you want or what absorbency you want from your pad. Um, no, you might want a buffer, whether that's a chase buffer or whether you want to have a blocking solution, they could help. But again, we really would need to understand your specific assay in order to comment in more detail over what would be appropriate for this test, unfortunately. Thank you so much, Lee Jenkins. We are out of time. I want to thank you. Would you like to provide any closing remarks to our audience before we close today? Yes, just uh, thank you to everybody who joined in. Um, you know, I've mentioned quite a few times that there's not a one-size-fits-all answer for everything, and that it is very case-specific. 
So, you know, please, I encourage all of our customers, if they are interested, we are more than happy to continue this conversation offline. Get in contact with your local account managers or your local field application support, and we can help um, talk more specific to your tech and what we can do for you. Thanks, Thank you again. Thank you again, sir. And I want to thank Claus for his time as well. And I want to thank our audience for their outstanding questions and their participation. Just as a reminder, any questions that were submitted but not answered today by our speaker will be addressed via email. And this presentation will be available for on-demand viewing for 12 months. Please remember to share it with your colleagues who may have been interested in this topic but missed today. And don't miss out on the other presentations on our agenda visit the agenda tab in the auditorium for a full listing. Take care and thank you again for your participation. Until next time, stay safe and stay healthy. Bye-bye.